Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Heating Up the Geopolitics of the Arctic, organized by the Council on Geostrategy, the newest foreign affairs think tank based in the heart of London and dedicated to making the United Kingdom, as well as our free and open nations, more united, stronger and greener. The United Kingdom is the nearest neighbor to the Arctic region, which is central to British security interests and the wider North Atlantic. Yet the rise of the People Republics of China and its self-declared status of being the near Arctic state, Russian militarization of the Arctic waters, ongoing geopolitical tensions between Russia, the US and China are all entangling the Arctic in a renewed geopolitical competition. Arctic territories and resources are becoming more and more contested, whereas climate change is continuously stimulating a substantial change in the natural environment. The integrated review published last year noted that through its role as a state observer to the Arctic Council, the UK should contribute to maintaining the region as one of high cooperation and low tension, retain a significant contribution to Arctic science, focus on understanding the implications of climate change, and commit to working with its partners to ensure that increasing access to the region and its resources is managed safely, sustainably, and responsibly. And today we have a wonderful opportunity to discuss how the UK, together with its allies and partners, can ensure that the Arctic remains secure, sustainable, and prosperous with our three distinguished panelists, Professor Dame Jean Francis, James Gray, and Lieutenant General Richard Nugy. Professor Dame Jean Francis is Director of the British Antarctic Survey, a research center of the Natural Environment Research Council. She's involved with international polar organizations such as the Antarctic Treaty and European Polar Board and on several, is on several advisory boards of national polar programs. We are also absolutely delighted to be joined today by our advisory council member, James Gray, who's also a member of the Environment Audit Committee at the House of Commons. James Gray has served as MP for North Wiltshire since 1997 and was appointed as a Shadow Minister of Defence in 2001. He has served with the distinction on a variety of House of Commons committees, including the Defence Select Committee, and he is currently on the Environmental Audit Committee and the Chairman of the EPPG on Polar Regions. And we are also absolutely delighted to be joined by Lieutenant General Richard Nugy, who is a non-executive director for climate change and defense. Prior to his work on sustainability, he spent four years as chief of defense people. His military career of 36 years includes joint single service and international appointments. Richard Nugy was appointed as non-executive director for climate change and sustainability in March 2021. Before this appointment, he spent a year leading on the climate change and sustainability strategic approach at the Ministry of Defense. And before we start, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Our panelists will speak for up to 10 minutes each, and in the second half of the hour, we will move to our Q&A session with the audience. We will start with Professor Dean Jean Francis, followed by James Gray, and then followed by Lieutenant General Nugy. You can ask your questions during the whole course of the event, but please make sure to indicate your name, role, and affiliation and to whom you are addressing your question. So without any further delay, Professor Dame Jane Francis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm going to show you some slides in a moment just to start with the background on Antarctic science, uh, Arctic science, but um, I just want to explain what my blouse is. So some of you may be aware that these are climate stripes. These were developed by Ed Hawkins in the University of Reading. But this particular uh, pattern is specifically for the Arctic. So we have worked with a group from Dress Code Shirts on a special art science project uh, to plot Arctic temperature change over the last 70 years. There we go. So from blue, he's doing it the opposite way around, from blue is um, 20, uh, 1950, and the red, red going to red here is 2020. So that cycle over there is 70 years, which is you know the average lifespan. And what the uh, data records in the Arctic show is that there was a 3.4 degrees centigrade temperature change in mean annual temperature over one lifespan. That is quite amazing. So in, in one lifespan, the, the Arctic mean annual temperature has increased by th over three degrees. To me, that's quite scary. I'm just going to share my screen now just to show you a few slides to illustrate some of the science that, um, that may be relevant. So this is really just to give you a background, which some of you I'm sure will know if you're interested in the Arctic. The Arctic sea ice has been shrinking rapidly. Um, and this map shows you this uh, in, this is for 2020 last year. And in September 15th, you can see this is the seventh lowest record of the extent 
of the Arctic sea ice for a long time. So um, I'm just going to close that window so I can see from, from 1981 to, to 210, that was the average. And now we're way, way below. So that's the extent. And now this um, diagram is important because it shows the age of the ice, because it's about the thickness of the ice and the, the multi-year ice, as it's called, which really is the ice which is, let me go back, is um, really the ice that is melting the least. So you can see, although the Arctic is warming two to three times on globally, some of the thick ice is also going across the Arctic Ocean. So here we have um, some time ago, and here we've got more recently, and you can see that I can't see the temperatures anymore because they're above the bar. They're bar. Um, here we've got the thick ice, the multi-year ice, which is absolutely stuck around the top of uh, um, Canada and Greenland. And that multi-year ice even now has been blown out by uh, storms over the last couple of years. So we are losing that ice, the, the firm ice, the thick ice on the Arctic. This diagram here from Carbon Brief shows the tipping points related to the Arctic. So the tipping points are the points at which uh, scientists believe that the, when, when the temperatures rise to certain levels, they could push the Earth into irreversible change. So some change that's going on now may be reversible, but there are some areas that just may be too much and that will be irreversible. And you can see there for the Arctic, one of the really key things is the permafrost across the whole of the Arctic, which is melting. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And um, there's a lot of shift northwards that shows the boreal forest on land, but some of the fish in the ocean are moving north as well. So the ice is disappearing and the permafrost is melting. The Greenland ice cap is also being affected and is melting from, from the surface. So there's a lot of climate change going on in the Arctic, which if it reaches a certain point may become irreversible. So I picked out just a few things to talk about, not the whole of the science in the Arctic, but just a few things that may be relevant to um, the topic of discussion today. And of course, one of the big arguments is about what will happen to the ocean as the ice melts and it becomes an open ground for all sorts of activities in the future. And I'll mention shipping uh, and, and exploration a, a bit later, but it's heartening to know that actually some action has been already taken in the central Arctic Ocean. So the central Arctic Ocean in um, outlined in red there is an area beyond the borders of the um, Arctic countries with it where there is no claim, but there are deep high seas there. And there's quite a lot of, um, it's, a lot of it you can see is covered by ice at the moment, but that's diminishing rapidly. And many of the Arctic countries have agreed a moratorium. They signed it last year to ban um, fishing for at least 16 years and renewable for five years in periods after that to allow the Central Arctic Ocean to remain free of fishing. And this will allow research to understand the ecosystem in the central part of the Arctic before it's any kind of exploitation. So hooray for the moratorium. As the Arctic, is, Arctic ice is melting, we have already seen an increase in shipping traffic across the Arctic Ocean. And it's becoming a major highway for transport of goods and um, is, is is much cheaper and quicker to go through the Arctic Ocean, if possible, than to go all the way around other continents and, and through um, other waters. And the ice is melting sufficiently that some of these large ships no longer require an icebreaker, or they soon will not require an icebreaker, they'll be able to go by themselves. So the, the shipping trade is, is only can only increase through some of these Arctic areas. It brings with them quite a lot of potential for new uh, problems, including a lot of pollution. There are oil, potential for oil spills, exchange of ballast water, which carries with it um, bugs and um, shells and animal life from different parts of the oceans, from different oceans, even around the world as the ships come into the Arctic. 
there's a potential for a lot more waste, including plastic, but also general waste in the Arctic. And also the impact of noise on the animals that live in the Arctic. There's quite a lot of research that's beginning now about Arctic uh, shipping and the potential for pollution, for atmospheric pollution, uh, black carbon from the particles of, um, of um, uh, pollution that comes from the, from the ships, from the burning of the fuel, and, and also the noise. So this is a, a big area for research that's about to take off now. And of course, the Arctic is a home to a very rich ecosystem that will be affected both by the human presence in the Arctic as the Arctic ice um, diminishes, and also by the ice itself. So you can see this, this really simplified uh, food chain is quite um, sensitive to ocean. It's ocean temperatures, which affects, say, the phytoplankton, the small plants and animals that are at the bottom of the food chain. Um, they affect the, the small uh, zooplankton, the small animals that then feed the fish, then feed the whales, then feed the, the, the shells on the bottom. And then there's all the higher predators on the ice. As the ice melts, and that white reflective surface uh, changes into a dark sea, the albedo, the reflectivity will change and the ocean will change itself. So there, is, um, there are already big changes going on in the Arctic Ocean. There's a lot of fish from the more southern latitudes which are migrating north, that's already happening and they will probably uh, deplete the sort of Arctic cod and the other um, animals that are used to living in the Arctic themselves. There's a lot of research ongoing into this at the moment as well. One of the major, major problems, which I think it will certainly impact on security, is the melting of the permafrost. Um, the permafrost covers huge areas of the Arctic, huge areas in Russia, but also across Alaska and Canada and, and the other Arctic nations. And it's clearly beginning to melt now. And there's ample evidence of the impact. Here you can see a collection of, of pictures. The, the roads are buckling. Um, in Alaska, there's a picture there of Alaska, but in Canada and Russia and in other areas of the Arctic, the road network, the transport network is being disrupted by melting permafrost. You can see there in Canada trees, some of the trees which are sort of keep the, uh, the soil stable are falling over as the permafrost melts. And then there's huge damage now already reported to buildings, not just small buildings like this one here, which is in Alaska on the top right, but also major um, cities, uh, the large tower blocks, major infrastructure is suffering from um, melting permafrost. And of course the permafrost melting is a real uh, disaster because as the ground melts, methane from the rotting plant material in the permafrost is increasing the global temperature. Um, methane is a greenhouse gas and it's increasing the temperature as it melts. I've also put that picture in, in the bottom right, which is Siberia. So one of the strange consequences of the melting permafrost is that there's a really rich hoard of uh, fossil material coming out, including these huge remains of mammoths. So there's actually, they call it the mammoth gold rush in Siberia. And they're finding the most remarkable um, fossils of sort of lion cubs and bits of mammoths and whole creatures are coming out of there. And put, unfortunately, there's also a rush for the ivory from mammoths, which is being sold around the world now. It's a different market. So the permafrost is revealing its riches, but they're also making some people very rich in the, indeed. Some of the changes, though, that are happening and the good news is that because the changing Arctic is going to affect, affect the indigenous communities that live around the Arctic most severely, and it really will change their way of life. And it's really important that they are um, involved in much of the, the, uh, the, the governance and in the research that goes in on about the Arctic environment and Arctic change. And certainly in Canada, there's a, a, a very big change now and the indigenous, indigenous communities themselves are taking charge of some of the research that have to be included in research projects in the Canadian Arctic. And they themselves are looking specifically using their traditional knowledge 
to understand how the Arctic change will affect them and their lives in the Arctic, which is really quite critical. And this is my wild card. I just want to throw this in. I'm a geologist by training. And so I have looked to the past to try and understand what's happening to the, going to happen to the future. And this is a new reconstruction by artist James Mackay and scientist in Leeds, Alan Hayward, that is the new reconstruction of Greenland. Probably this was about 3 million years ago. But the interesting thing is that 3 million years ago, the geological record, tells us that the CO2 content of the atmosphere was about 400 parts million. Today, the CO2, right today, the CO2 level is 415 parts per million. So we can look back at the past to see what uh, might come, the climate change that's coming for us in the future. So um, this picture is based on reconstructing the Greenland environment. And you can see there are no major ice caps on Greenland at 400 parts a million. They will probably be gone. And instead, there may be remains of some valley glaciers. But you can see a lot more vegetation in Antarctica, uh, sorry, in the Arctic. Those birds there are great orcs that went extinct. But there is a potential for a whole new ecosystem to develop in the Arctic as it warms. So I think we're looking at uh, a position as, as my tipping, um, tipping point slide shows that we're getting close to tipping points and there is change happening in the Arctic, which may not be stopped. Thank you very much. I'll just stop sharing my screen now. There we go. Thank you, Professor Dame Jean Francis, for this informative presentation. And now I would like to ask Mr. James Gray uh, to give his speech. Thank you. Well, Victoria, thank you very much indeed. Can I first of all congratulate you and also James and the rest of the team on getting the Council on Geostrategy up and running. It does great work in, in, in these kind of areas. And I'm proud to be on your advisory council, although whether my advice is up to very much, I'm not sure. But nonetheless, I'll keep advising you anyhow. And can I thank Jane, Dame, Dame Jane? We always call Dame Jane to differentiate her from the other, other great polar expert, Jane Rumble, the Foreign Office. She's Jane Rumble and, and Jane Francis is always Dame Jane. So, but can I thank you and congratulate you on what you just told us? And it sets the background to what uh, General Nuji and I will be talking about now very, very clearly indeed, and these huge changes that are occurring uh, in the Arctic. And the curious thing about the geopolitics of the Arctic, uh, as opposed to the environment, is that it's a kind of inverted parabola, I suppose is the right expression. Uh, from about the time of the Second World War until um, at the end of the uh, Soviet Empire, uh, the Arctic and the North Atlantic were major geopolitical concerns. Uh, the Soviet Union had huge resources up there. Uh, NATO counted it. The Greenland, Iceland, UK gap was of all importance because that was the gap that ensured that we could re-supply uh, Europe in the event of some major catastrophe or war. Um, and the Russians built uh, a vast uh, nuclear um, arsenal largely on the Kola Peninsula, but also right, elsewhere right across the, the high north. And so during that period, from the Second World War until the end of the Soviet Union, it really was a, a hugely important area. We had great assets up there. We had anti-submarine warfare assets, for example, and the Russians, and of course, with submarines, uh, and the Russians did uh, really was very, very strongly um, militarized. Uh, interesting that we actually haven't had an underized capability since then. Uh, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Then from the end of the Soviet Union, around about whatever, 1990 or thereabouts, uh, until relatively recently, uh, the Arctic went quiet, I think, with the right expression, the right way of putting it. Uh, the Russians demilitarized to a significant degree. They, they abandoned a large number of their bases. There had been a large number of bases along the, the, the 20,000-mile Arctic coast. A large number of them were then abandoned. They reduced the number of submarines and, and, and above, uh, above water vessels as well. Um, they reduced the amount of uh, cold weather training. Uh, and in general, the, the, the whole Arctic coast became a much less uh, militarized area from the Soviet standpoint. NATO, meanwhile, became fixated by hot and dusty places uh, in the Middle East. They, they believed the main uh, threat was from uh, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism. Uh, and the whole NATO uh, fixation was with, um, uh, with the Middle East. I remember visiting NATO several times, and on each occasion, this was back maybe about 10 years ago now, I always used to raise the question of the Arctic. And the generals looked at me as if I was kind of slightly odd, a bit out of date, and didn't know what I was talking about. 
and, and moved on to talk about, sorry, I didn't, my journals, I wasn't including General Nuji, he wasn't one of them. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, they, really the high north wasn't of any significant uh, interest at all to NATO. Uh, they believed and they thought or they hoped they would remain an area of peace and stability and for, for, for science and, and all the rest of it. And they were actually right for, for that period until uh, very recently, until five or ten years ago now, I suppose the Arctic was indeed an icy wilderness that nobody paid much attention uh, to. But that uh, inverted parabola has now gone back up to the other end of the parabola. That's, I was never much good at geometry, but anyhow, you know what I mean. Um, uh, and now we see uh, Russia significantly increasing uh, this militarization of the Arctic. We see a vast quantity of, uh, of submarine activity in the Arctic. Uh, we see a, a significant number of, of Russian troops um, trained in Arctic warfare. Um, and we see um, uh, a huge, I'll come back to this one second, a huge uh, exercise right at this moment occurring up there. Simul simultaneously, the NATO uh, have realized the threat and they've switched their attention, the establishment of Marcom in Northwood uh, and a variety of other things. So again, I'll come back to it in a second. NATO have begun to realize the threat from Russia in the high north into the North Atlantic uh, and are refocusing uh, northward. So it's a kind of parabola and we're back up at the top end of the inverted parabola. Now, before I go on to talk about the consequences of that, I thought it just worth touching on why that should be. Uh, and Dame Jane uh, touched on at least one of the reasons for this, namely uh, the Northern Sea Route, the notion that the ice is now retreating so fast uh, that there will soon be a significant shipping lane that goes from Japan and China uh, through to Europe and America. And at least theoretically, that might be the case. However, the interesting thing is that the most recent moment uh, of which we have uh, accurate figures for vessels transiting the Northern Sea Route is, was the year 2020, uh, when there were 16 vessels only, 16 vessels, very few really, a million tons uh, of cargo, which may sound a lot, but each of these ships is 50 or 60,000 tons, so it's not that much. There were many more than that going to and from the Arctic, particularly going to the Yamal Peninsula, uh, where the Russians have their vast... Uh, uh, LNG base and various other minerals, um, things being found in, in the Yamal. Um, so a number of ships going to and from it, around about 64 ships, we think, going to and from the Yamal, but only 16 actually went across it. It's an eight-day transit, um, and only one of those 16 used an icebreaker. Uh, however, just as a in passing, a friend of mine who owns two um, heavy lift ships, the Pugnax and the Audax, the two other two um, heavy lift uh, ice, ice condition, ice uh, class ships, they're both stuck just off the Wrangell, Peninsula, Wrangell Island, or they have been until recently at least, um, in the ice. So it actually is much, is much greater. He, he's been going backwards and forwards to, to the Yamal Peninsula regularly uh, over, the, over the season. His ships now very recently got stuck in the ice, which of course is something which a, a ship owner doesn't want to happen. And if you think that in the same period, compared to the 18 ships, that are available, uh, Asian ships went across um, uh, the, through, through the Northern Sea Route. Um, uh, 18,000 uh, ships went through the Suez Canal and 15,000 went through Panama. So a tiny number went through, uh, the, um, the, the, through, through the Northern Sea Route. It may get worse, it may get bigger, it may well develop, the ice may well leave, but right now, the Northern Sea Route actually, in terms of commerce, is insignificant and therefore perhaps we shouldn't worry too much about it. Now, the second question I think to ask is who controls it? Uh, and of course, the, for most of that 15,000 mile border is the Russians. Uh, they control obviously the, the 12 miles out, um, although they do make a claim for an extended economic zone north of there, depending on how you define the continental shelf. A friend of mine, a Swedish, uh, a Swedish philanthropist, uh, took a submersible down to the surface of the Arctic um, many years ago now, together with the Russian explorer Artur Chilingarov, and planted, because he couldn't find anything else to plant there, a Russian flag. That's interpreted as being some kind of uh, uh, Russian claim on the North Pole. It wasn't, of course. Uh, and my friend, uh, uh, who's a Swedish, Swede, <laughs> was a Swede, was no more claiming the North Pole for, uh, for Russia than where the astronauts they landed on the moon planting an American flag. They weren't claiming the, the moon to be American. But nonetheless, the Russians are casting their eyes northwards, depending on how you define the continental shelf and therefore the area of their uh, expanded economic zone. Um, 
Now, the Russians are saying, and they've said very recently, that um, the significant, uh, their interest, the significant increase in militarization in the Arctic is for three reasons, they say. First of all, um, it's for search and rescue. What would happen if a, if a passenger vessel sank? Well, that's true, but if the, if the northern sea isn't opened up, uh, you don't invest hundreds of billions of dollars in, in search and rescue against the potential of a ship that can't go there at the moment, potentially sinking. I think that doesn't really hold much water, quite frankly. And secondly, of course, they have got their, their big uh, economic interests up there, particularly the Yamaha, but also right across the Arctic co coast. Uh, the Russians have got significant economic interests. Um, but thirdly, they realize that there is a, going to be great potential uh, from, from transiting vessels in the future. Um, Moscow put out a press release this week saying that current, I quote, following a direct quote from, from Moscow, from the Russian government, current deployments are to rehearse repelling military threats and ensure the security of sea lanes and Russia's areas of maritime economic activity in the northern seas in the event of a crisis. Now, repelling military threats is interesting, and they're perfectly entitled to do that, just as we, the RAF, deployed down the Norfolk coast, repelling potential military threats against the UK, unlikely as they may seem, nonetheless, we have that. They're perfectly entitled to station as many troops and ships and submarines along their coast as they wish. But frankly, the chances of anyone in the world attacking Russia by, by any means, whether that be through the Ukraine, incidentally, or certainly not by the Arctic, are vanishingly unlikely. NATO is not about to launch an attack on Russia through the Arctic coast. And therefore, the, again, the, the, the notion that they are positioning vast quantities of resources up there to defend themselves against America or against the NATO, frankly, is extremely unlikely. And therefore, it has to be because they believe there will be a big um, economic and, and commercial expansion in the future. And we're seeing that already. Uh, Dame Jane mentioned the, the, the fisheries, 16-year moratorium. Great, uh, but will it last? And if it really does open up, I mean, who's going, to, who's going to abide by it? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Oil and gas, minerals. We saw this week the British government forming a, a free trade agreement with Greenland, and uh, Greenland, of course, being the home of one-third of the world's rare earths. The other two-thirds being controlled by China. China showing a huge interest uh, in the control and influence within uh, within Greenland. So all of those mineral interests are of gigantic um, uh, importance in the North. And a lot of the geopolitical matters, which I'm now going to move on to the military matters, uh, are, must come as a result of, of, of those interests. Now, Russia, as I say, they built up their, their bases. They built, I think, a total of 64 bases that we know about uh, in the North, including quite a substantial quantity around the Kola Peninsula near Murmansk. But right across to as far, as far across as Wrangell Island, which is only a, a few hundred miles away from Alaska. And they're deploying, amongst other things, it's alleged, uh, the, the Poseidon torpedo, which is one of the most vicious weapons the world has ever known. Of course, because was underwater being a, a torpedo. Uh, it's very stealthy. You don't know it's coming, and it can be nuclear armed. So they are deploying, we think, we understand, uh, the Poseidon torpedo. And equally, the Sercon hypersonic rocket equally is being based on the Cole Peninsula. This is a rocket that, as the word indicates, which can go so fast you can't see it coming. And again, is perfectly capable of, of being, of carrying a nuclear warhead if that would be the case. They currently have an exercise in the Arctic. They have uh, the bombers and MiG-31s very close to Alaska. And of course, Alaska is only a matter of 20, 30 miles away from Russia. But there are currently 30 warships in Russia, including the Barents. Uh, there are 20 aircraft and 1,200 personnel taking part in their uh, exercise at this moment uh, as we speak in the Arctic. And the Russians have reinvented the bastion concept, which they had during the Cold War, which stretches their influence out into the North Sea, including on some maps, at least uh, Kirkwall and the islands, uh, on the islands, the Shetland Islands, uh, perhaps not very significantly, but nonetheless a huge bastion, which uh, they, they, they claim. We are countering that to a degree, as I mentioned. We have uh, deploying our, our anti-submarine warfare airplanes. We've, I'm glad to say we've now bought, uh, I think it's six or eight of them, which will remind me. Um, we're renewing our under ice capability, although quite interesting this week, three Russian submarines came up through the ice in the Arctic. We, we managed only one so far. Um, Warrior was it not last year? I think it was or the year before. Um, and the Russians had three came up through the ice simultaneously uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, and we are increasing our, our the training of our Royal Marines uh, in the high north of uh, north of Norway. But I mean, so we're doing our best, but uh, nothing by comparison with what the Russians uh, have been doing. 
Just in passing, I'll just throw in a couple of ideas. Two areas of particular concern, I think, if I was Mr. Putin trying to think of something very clever to do. There are two places I think are particular concern. The one is the Swedish island of Gotland in the Baltics, uh, and uh, is now some defendant, but until recently it wasn't. Uh, and if there were to be uh, unattributable Russian soldiers landing on that island, uh, Sweden, of course, not being part of NATO, uh, would that be a, an Article 5 moment for NATO to react? Probably not, but it might be. And the other one I think we need to watch out for is Svalbard, which, of course, is uh, covered by the Svalbard Treaty of 1926, wasn't it, Jane, I think? Um, again, uh, Svalbard should be non, non-military. It can't be used by the military. But the Russians have got two fully equipped military bases there, and I've visited them both. And I've been to many military bases in my time, uh, and both um, Pyramiden and Barentsburg would be easily used by the Russians as a, for a military purpose if they wish to do so. And again, if I was Putin trying to test out NATO, I'd put some, um, uh, some some restoration troops on the ground to maintain the buildings, rather like the Argentinians sent the the, the, uh, the the metal merchants in scrap metal merchants into Georgia, if you remember before the uh, the Falklands. So I think I think Gotland and, and Svalbard are places that we ought to watch out for. And I think that the there are knock on effects from what's happening in Ukraine at the moment uh, in what the Russians are doing in the high north. The Chinese equally, uh, not in a, in a military way, but the Chinese are showing vastly increased interest. They, of course, are building icebreakers. They've got two conventional ones plus a new nuclear-powered one on its way. By comparison to that, of course, Russia's got 40 icebreakers. Uh, we, or America, have, I think, one or perhaps two is a, a little, of that order. Uh, and the Polar Silk, Silk, Silk Road, uh, China's Polar Silk Road, I think is very significant over the last year visiting a Chinese so-called research station in the far north of Iceland. Um, it was a solid concrete block with not a single scientist in it, not, not, a, not, a, not a piece of equipment. And without, without question at all, it was a geopolitical footprint, which they're pl- plonking in Iceland. Uh, and I, I think they also, I'm certain, have uh, a significant interest in influencing Greenland. There's no, no secret about that. They've, they've sought to offer, for example, large amounts of money to build the new air, airports uh, in Greenland, which wasn't accepted. But nonetheless, the Chinese have very significant and very realistic, and for, for good reason, interest in Greenland. Now, the final question I just want to ask briefly, if I have time, Victoria, very, very briefly, uh, is what we do about all this, because I think it is very significant indeed. Um, I think uh, both the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Defence are due to produce their Arctic strategies at some stage. We don't know when that will be. I'd imagine later this year, I don't know whether it's one strategy or two, but they are, uh, there'll be some stuff coming out from the British government uh, shortly. It'll be interesting to see um, how that differs from previous Arctic strategies produced by the British government. In the past, we've always said perfectly correctly, I wouldn't disagree with it, uh, that we're not members of the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council are the organization that really ought to have control of what happens in the Arctic. We want to keep the Arctic as a peaceful, uh, science-based place. We don't want uh, warfare. We don't want increased um, uh, geostrategic uh, worries up there. And therefore, we've gone to great lengths really not to upset the Arctic Council members. Um, they, of course, include both America and Canada. I think that's changing, and I think the MOD probably take a slightly different view, although I may well be proved wrong on this. I think the MOD take the view this is a significant military risk to the United Kingdom, and we have to take it very seriously indeed, and we have to uh, do something about it. So it'll be interesting to see what the government come up with uh, during that uh, time. The one thing I'm certain of is that if half of what we've been talking about here comes to pass, if the Northern Sea Route opens up, if uh, we have all of these developments with uh, fisheries, with tourism, with uh, minerals, with oil and gas. If all of this happens, and many, many people, many scientists, including, as we heard from Dame Jane earlier on, if half of that happens, where there's money, where there is uh, a poten- commercial potential, there is, there is threat of military kind. And therefore, I think the chance of there being a military escalation in the Arctic and in the North Atlantic in the next 10 or 20 years is extremely high, extremely high. Whatever won't happen, but nonetheless, I fear the likelihood is very large indeed. And all I'd say, I think, at this stage to the British government, and indeed to NATO, it would be that we must be ready for that. We can no longer turn our back on the high north, on the North Atlantic, and on the Arctic. It's a very serious area of military concern, and I call on the government and on NATO to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray, for your important insights. And Lieutenant General uh, Nuji, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Victoria. There is a real, real, real difficulty going after such um, uh, eminent uh, panelists in that um, uh, uh, most of my sandwiches have been eaten already, but um, that's um, entirely um, uh, appropriate by people who are far more eminent than I. I, I, I thought I might pick up one or two um, uh, of the questions as well as try and answer some, uh, uh, try and put a slightly different perspective on it, perhaps. And, and one of the questions is about um, uh, salinity in the um, uh, in the Arctic. Um, and, and I think there's um, one of the tipping points that uh, Dame Jane didn't mention, but I think is is of particular concern, is the um, Atlantic meridional, uh, meridional overturning circulation, which is allowing for the Arctic ice, uh, which is being thinned by a metre a year, uh, to be attacked both from below, because there's much more hot water coming up through the Gulf Stream, um, uh, which is allowing for um, uh, fresh water to go back down through the um, Greenland ice and gap, um, uh, which is causing um, uh, much more concern, actually, to the wider climate change, I think, uh, than just the Arctic. And that, that's perhaps why um, she didn't mention it, because I think that is of global importance. And so not only are you getting reduced salinity, but you're getting much, much warmer water coming back down. Eventually, um, uh, you'll see that slowing altogether, that um, uh, meridional overturning. And the effect of that, of, of, of overturning that circulation, is just hotter and hotter and hotter seas, um, which will do significant damage to uh, both the uh, global uh, temperature um, uh, as a result of climate change, but also to all the, um, uh, the life in the seas um, as it becomes more difficult to operate. And so I think there is a, a real concern there. Um, not only, and the important point about the Arctic is, is those extraordinary slides that Dame Jane showed, showed um, uh, both melt from above because um, uh, as, as there's less sea ice, there's more water which absorbs heat more than uh, than the ice which reflects it, but also this this undercurrent, if you like, of water, uh, of hot water coming up. And uh, but between uh, 1950 and today, there's been a 15% reduction in that circulation. That, I think, is significantly worrying and, and is one of those tipping points. Now, what scientists, um, uh, I don't think, know yet is, is, is uh, when that tipping point will be reached. It could be some time away. Um, or it might be uh, more close. Anyway, that's the sort of answer to that question. This is of concern, I think, and a significant concern. Um, uh, there are a couple of other questions which I'll, which I'll follow through, particularly the, the sort of submarine fleet. And as, as, as James uh, mentioned, um, this, um, we have put a, a submarine under the Arctic. Um, we've recreated that capability. We lost it, as he said. Um, we've recreated this. And in fact, um, uh, there was uh, just recently, I think, um, uh, I saw uh, that not only did the UK put one submarine up, but the US put two submarines up next door, so to speak. So we did have three NATO submarines up there um, at the same time. And I think that is partly why the Russians reacted with three submarines of their own, um, to show that they also could do it. But actually, there's far more power in terms of geopolitical relations that um, it was US and UK working together in tandem coming up through the ice than, than, than just a single nation, which of course is much easier to coordinate. Um, and so I think there, there is a significance there. And the, um, the uh, exercise which NATO is doing uh, very shortly, it's called Exercise Cold Response, uh, which takes place um, next month and the month after, 35,000 NATO troops. Um, we're sending the HMS Prince of Wales up uh, to the high north, um, as well as a, um, a, a other parts of our fleet is all to demonstrate exactly what James is saying, that we're beginning to take this extremely seriously. Um, and that we are, if you like, the second nation in terms of putting hardware up into the North um, uh, uh, behind the United States. But I thought I'd, I'd, I'd sort of cover a little bit to sort of some of the um, dates that um, are, are sort of significant, um, which sort of provides an overview of what James uh, was saying very largely in the geopolitical space, and I think that is significant. It was it was in 2018, in January, in fact, that uh, 2018 that China declared itself as a near Arctic state. I think this is of concern. Um, it is concerned. I mean, they have no Arctic uh, direct Arctic um, uh, 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 geography, um, but it's a concern they declare themselves the near Arctic state, and implying, in the same way that we are a near Arctic state in the UK. Uh, that they have as much influence and as much significance to the Arctic as the UK or somebody like us does. Um, I would fundamentally disagree, but of course they are interested in the sea routes, uh, just like, and I think in 15 to 20 years time, the scientists that I speak to say there'll be open water, uh, so there'll be no ice in the summer, 
um, in 15 to 20 years time in the Arctic. It'll close in the winter, of course, but not in the summer. And that is of real concern because then it becomes like any other sea, except that um, uh, the Russians in uh, March 2019 uh, stated that, um, well, they put into a draft law, it hasn't been executed as a law, so if you like, it's a white paper at the moment, that foreign warships were not allowed anywhere near the Northern Sea Route. Now, if we accept that the Northern Sea Route is um, international waters, it's outside the territorial waters of Russia, uh, but goes around the north of uh, the North Pole, if you like, or from our perspective, um, then, then the reality is that that is a, a direct threat to our freedom of navigation. Uh, and in fact, the first sea lord, um, or as he was then, first sea lord, now chief of defence staff, uh, Admiral Tony Radikin, made a point of saying that about um, uh, 11 months ago, 10, 11 months ago, that actually that um, represented a threat to our freedom of navigation. Um, you've got in 2019 significant changes um, in NATO, um, as well as in Russia that um, uh, James has mentioned, and, and particularly in NATO, the US, Every um, uh, part of uh, the US military now, all four services have, um, uh, have declared a um, Arctic strategy. Um, interestingly, uh, the, um, uh, the Arctic strategy from the Coast Guard is the most competitive, um, and they've been lobbying uh, uh, Congress for a long time now uh, for more uh, icebreakers um, uh, that they can put up there. The Canadians are building more ice capable ships, um, uh, naval ships, uh, to be able to go up there. Um, the Americans put uh, more fifth generation fighters into Alaska than anywhere else um, as a single base um, uh, in 2019. So 2019, I think we saw a significant change in attitude. And that was, um, if you like, reinforced by the fact that the second fleet, the US second fleet, um, was um, was told that it now had responsibility for the high north again, um, for the Arctic, and therefore a uh, part of the exercise today is to exercise. I'm uh, sorry, um, in the next couple of months is that uh, is to try and exercise that. This is despite in May 2021 um, Russia leading the Arctic Council. Now I've I, I've actually just down, been down to Antarctica, and in Antarctica there's a treaty. There's a treaty which um, is incredibly powerful, which has demilitarized uh, the Antarctic, um, has has made it a place where research uh, takes place, but frankly, nothing else. Um, and uh, there is no such treaty in the Arctic that is similar. The Arctic Council doesn't have the power that the um, the 12 nations, I think it was, that originally signed the Antarctic Treaty in 20, sorry, in 1959, uh, it doesn't have the power to do the same. So there is no limit apart from goodwill, um, uh, no restraint apart from goodwill um, in the Arctic. Um, and and it's interesting that uh, the Russians declared that they wanted a spirit of cooperation um, uh, and uh, promoting sustainable development uh, in 2019 when they took over the um, chairmanship, if you like, of the Arctic Council, but have done precisely the opposite in the way that James described in terms of reinforcing its bases, um, of, of putting a lot more troops up into the north and of creating many, many more ships that are Arctic uh, capable in the north. And what we're seeing, regardless of what they say, is a militarization of the north from uh, uh, from Russia. NATO uh, is responding in June last year. Uh, the alliance said that it will, quote, continue to undertake necessary calibrated and coordinated activities in support of alliance security interests. Um, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General, went out of his way to comment on the Arctic and comment on China's influence on the Arctic, um, uh, and, and that not necessarily being a benign influence we will see as it, as it develops. And so NATO is already, uh, if you like, beginning to sound, um, alarm bells is probably too strong, but it is certainly interested in what's happening in the Arctic. And it's not, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that with being distracted by Ukraine, Russia takes this as an opportunity to do more in the Arctic, hopefully without us noticing would be their view as we're um, interested in the Ukraine. And, and that is certainly what happened after the Crimea in 2014. They, they did lots of stuff whilst we were distracted uh, by uh, the Ukraine and the Crimea in 2014. Interestingly, the EU has also, Franz Timmermans um, has talked about full engagement being a geopolitical necessity. Um, 
And he said uh, the current scramble for position in, um, is putting uh, the entire region at risk and that the EU should be at the very least aware of it. Now, you might say the EU's got nothing to do with the Arctic. But actually, what is interesting is you're, you're beginning to see America, Canada, Sweden, which is not a NATO member, um, uh, uh, NATO and now the EU, all beginning to express concern about what's happening in the Arctic um, and all expressing concern that actually the Arctic must be kept safe and must be kept demilitarized as much as it can be. But I think those are, to a certain extent, uh, forlorn hopes. And, and if you look at the UK, James has explained our position extremely well, but if you look at the UK, Ben Wallace, as the Secretary of State, um, uh, declared in 20, uh, December, so only two months ago now, um, uh, that we must, quote, bolster our Arctic capability. And he's putting uh, the money where his mouth is with, with uh, more US, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Marines and so on. And we need to think about the future, about um, that, uh, if you like, that peace between open water and hard ice. Uh, uh, do we want to go into what the um, Canadians call disruptive ice, I, I tend to call it sludge ice, um, where you need slightly hardened hulls on some of our ships in order to be able to do it, but you don't need icebreaker capability. Um, is that the sort of thing we need on one or two of our frigates, certainly not all of them, uh, so that we can be there and maintain our freedom of navigation and our freedom of manoeuvre, um, should it be necessary in 10 to 15 years' time? So not on current ships, which would be grossly expensive, but perhaps building future ships to have that capability in perhaps 15 years time, as, as we get our new frigates. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there, but just to summarize um, uh, a comment that was made um, uh, uh, earlier, which is that climate change, uh, which is the sort of font of all this, because it is opening up the Arctic in a way uh, that um, hasn't been opened up before. Um, and we'll have geopolitical um, uh, implications. Uh, James mentioned the amount of shipping going through Suez. 22% of the world's shipping goes through Suez. If we don't need to go through Suez, we won't, um, I would suggest, if it is easy to go through the Northern Sea routes and the, um, the Northwest Passage. But climate change is driving great power competition, and great power competition that includes China, as it declares itself a near-Arctic state, Russia, because it has such a large border, um, and America, because of its concerns over Alaska um, and uh, the freedom of its, its shipping through those routes. Um, and there will be, and there are geopolitical developments in the Arctic as a direct result. What we've got to do, everything we possibly can uh, to go back to where Dame Jane started, what we've got to do at every opportunity is to make sure this doesn't become a militarised and a security threat that boils into conflict. Because the damage that that would do to the Arctic is extraordinary. And I think we haven't seen the effect of that or won't see the effect of that until it's far too late if it ever gets to that position. I'll, I'll stop there, Victoria. Thank you very much, Lieutenant General Niji, for your incredibly important insights. Um, and well, then now we can move to our Q&A session and I would like to encourage all our attendees to ask their questions. But I have the very first question from myself. Um, to all the panelists. So, well, as mentioned, the integrated review, which was published last year, um, noted that um, through our role as a state observer to the Arctic Council, we should contribute to maintaining the region as one of high cooperation and low tension. So I would like just to ask all the panelists, what are the three key areas of focus for us in the upcoming years to fulfill this mission? Um, Professor Dame Francis. Uh, for me and for my side as a scientist uh, at the British Antarctic Survey and the UK community that works in the Arctic, I think to uh, continue science in the Arctic is really quite critical. There's lots of unanswered questions, but things are moving so fast in the Arctic. We can't afford really to sort of sit around and mull over potential projects uh, uh, and wait for years. The Arctic is changing. There are threats from, as I said, from shipping and other movements in, in the art, human intervention in the Arctic. And I think there's a lot of science to do. There are going to be some big projects about the Arctic. They're about to take off, I know. And um, both in terms of understanding the ecosystems in the Arctic, there's a lot of work on the permafrost, which is really important. And just understanding the whole Arctic system and the impacts and, and as, uh, as Lieutenant General Nuji said, it's not just about the Arctic. What happens in the Arctic does affect us all. And it affects us here in the UK because of the changes to the atmosphere, the changes to the ocean, 
and the changes in the North Atlantic, it, it is there's a lot of work going on to see how that will affect uh, the climate in the UK. So I think working with our Arctic, Arctic colleagues on other continents, which is the way um, the UK works a lot. There's a lot of scientists that have collaborative projects with many other Arctic countries and, and our own projects as well. I think it's absolutely critical to understand what is happening and what is going to happen to the Arctic in future. Thank you. Lieutenant General Nuji. So I'm, I'm not sure I can come up with three um, uh, because there's, there's, there's just a huge amount to do. I think uh, for me, the most important thing, and this is where um, uh, we are we are perhaps not in the best place at the moment, is to reopen uh, or to open genuine dialogue. The, um, uh, as, as a sort of adjunct to the Arctic Council, there was a um, Arctic uh, Chiefs of Defence type um, uh, meeting. Um, the Russians were uh, removed from that, or they, they left that um, as a result of the Crimea in 2014. Um, and so we ha don't have a really good dialogue and we don't have the, even the communication channels to be able to talk to the Russians. And, and frankly, I would invite the Chinese into that as well. The more that we talk um, uh, and, and reopen those um, Arctic chiefs um, as part of the Arctic Council, separate from the main Arctic Council, I think that is a really, really important way because um, what we're seeing, if you just take the face of what I said, you're just seeing a significant militarization of the, of, of the area over the last two to three years. And, and militarizations of areas can lead to mistakes. And if you don't have the channels open, we always had, you know, in the Cold War, the, 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 the red telephone between uh, Washington and Moscow. You know, if you don't have those open ch channels uh, where you can overcome potential mistakes or potential uh, moves which can be misinterpreted, uh, then actually uh, you end up with suspicion and you end up with a lack of trust. And that just builds actually militarization. So I would argue that the most important thing we can do is open up those communication channels. Thank you. And Mr. Gray. Um, part of what General Luigi calls for may well be my, my answer to the question, Victoria, because you asked, the question was whether or not the Arctic Council could do something about all this. And the answer is no, it can't, because under their rules, they aren't allowed to discuss defence or security. They're, that's entirely precluded. So they can talk about the environment, they can talk about uh, oil spills, they can talk about all kinds of things that sort, search and rescue. But they may not discuss defence, they may not discuss strategic matters. Uh, rather curiously, the Nordic Council does. There's an organization called the Nordic Council. They, they do discuss um, these matters, but the Arctic Council can't. And therefore, the question really is, is there some organization which ought to be doing what Richard Nuji suggests? There used to be the NATO Arctic uh, Council, or Committee, or Council, I think it was called. Uh, it didn't meet very often. It didn't do very much. It did meet, actually, briefly recently, but it wasn't, it wasn't very successful. But I'm rather keen on parliamentarians doing things together. And there is a thing called the Arctic Parliamentarians Assembly, which is going to be meeting, I think, in Greenland uh, later this year. And also, <clears throat> I chair the same event, the, the Antarctic Parliamentarians Assembly with regard to Antarctica. Um, and they both include both the Chinese and the Russians. They both attend uh, our events. And uh, it just might be that parliamentarians talking to each other uh, can do things that governments or military can't do. And there is also a very strong argument that if the economic uh, interests develop as fast as we think they're going to develop uh, in the Arctic, then we're going to need a much, much stronger organization. And certainly some of the banks that are investing up there are saying we can't rely on the Arctic Council. It's just talking shop. We can't rely on a few meetings here and there. We have some really strong organization to control uh, what happens in the high north. That, of course, doesn't currently exist. But I think that's precisely the nature of the meeting that you called today, Victoria. This meeting is actually to discuss what's happening in the Arctic and what on earth we do about it. And right now, there is no organization that will fulfill what Richard Nuji was calling for, namely dialogue with the Russians and the Chinese, and perhaps there ought to be. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, another question is from Carl Stephen Patrick Hunter, who is the chairman of Coltrake Ultrasonics Company. Um, he is asking, what impact do the panel believe that greater conversation in, on the Arctic will have on the Royal Navy submarine fleet? Um, I guess, well, Lieutenant General Nuji, over to you. Um, yes, and I, I, I sort, sort of um, uh, implied this, but I think that... Um, we, 
we have two effectively different types of submarine. Um, we have uh, nuclear submarines uh, that hold our nuclear deterrent. I don't think it'll have any particular effect on that. They spend, um, they have spent over 50 years now uh, defending this country without being found um, uh, uh, somewhere in um, uh, in the oceans of the world. And I think that that's really important that that ma is maintained. So I don't think it'll have a direct effect on that. But on our hunter killer submarines, um, and we've obviously got the new astute class coming out. Um, I think that the um, that the Ministry of Defence, well, I know the Ministry of Defence is looking very actively at um, how much uh, we uh, put into a Arctic capability, being able to come up through the um, uh, ice and so on. So I think, um, uh, are we going to buy more submarines? No, I don't think so. Um, are we going to uh, put more in the Arctic? Well, I would say that uh, compared to the last 20 years, yes. Um, but I but I couldn't possibly comment on, on how many and how often. Uh, because that would be operationally um, uh, confidential. But uh, but I think the important point is it is now part of the sphere where it, um, of of operations, whereas it wasn't 10 to 15 years ago. And I see that continuing now um, until um, well uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Lieutenant General Nuji. Another question is from James London, and he's asking um, the following question. Water salinity is being significantly affected by permamelt. I referred to this in my lecture tours over 30 years ago. Can something more be mentioned on this and its threat to oceanic temperature change, including fish stocks? Uh, Professor Dame Francis. Join your mute. Thank you. We've covered this a little bit. And um, of course, as the ice is melting, as the um, permafrost is melting, there is more water, fresh water coming into the whole system. And that does affect the ecosystems. I mean, that does affect how some of the uh, animals and plants <coughs> live in the ocean. Um, as the ice melts as well, that also affects, we've mentioned the, Antar uh, the, the Arctic meridional overturning, which is as the ice is melting, particularly in Greenland, that freshwater pulse that's coming off of Greenland is affecting the structure of the North Atlantic Oceans. And in turn, that will may affect the climate even here in the UK. So yes, fresh water coming into the system will have a, a, a large effect on both the Arctic Ocean itself and the surrounding ocean. Thank you. Um, the next question is from James Rogers um, from the Council on Geostrategy. He's very keen to ask this question, um, Mr. Gray. Um, should Britain be more active in asserting its position as a near Arctic state, in your view? Um, before I ask that, um, as a pol all politicians do, can I just put in context this question of uh, what's at risk here? I, I used to be a ship in shipping. And shipping something like 100,000 tons per ship, let's say, from uh, South America to China, took about 60 or 70 days steaming. If you were to do the same route uh, via the Northern Sea route, it might take about 30 or 40 days. You'd be saving something like 15, maybe 20 days steaming, depending on how fast how fast ship is, of course. Uh, and a ship would probably cost something like uh, 20 or 30 thousand dollars a day plus fuel. You're talking about maybe up to a million, million dollars sa uh, saving on each voyage. And bearing in mind something like 35,000 voyages go through the uh, Panama and the Suez at the moment, you're talking billions if the Northern Sea Route were to open. If that would be the case, it'd be a very, very significant part of the uh, of, of our, our interests. I'm sure the Royal Navy would take a very, very keen interest indeed in what was happening out there. Um, sorry, that's us answer the previous question, which is a very bad politician's habit. I shouldn't do that. Um, to answer James's point, uh, yes, I think to some limited degree, I, I wouldn't be critical at all. I'm a very strong supporter of the Polar Regions Department of the Foreign Office. They do a fantastic job, often under difficult circumstances. So I'm not critical of them even slightly. But I do think that all of these developments uh, in the High North mean that they, there is a significant need for Britain to do far more. We slightly, we take a great interest in Antarctica, and always have done because of for obvious reasons. Uh, we have slightly, even though the Shetlands are only 400 miles away from the Arctic Circle, we've slightly not done as much up there as I think we should do. And I think that these uh, commercial and military and geopolitical and diplomatic and fishing uh, changes that are occurring up there right now demand a greater interest from the UK than has been the case up to now. I'm looking forward to seeing the, 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 the British government's uh, Arctic strategy paper later this year, and I suspect probably it will encapsulate quite a lot of these changes. But I think in answer to James's question, yes, I think 
I think now is the time when Britain must uh, once again we discovered the North Pole. We, we, we are very significant players uh, in the Arctic over the last several hundred years. We slightly, in my view, turned our back on it. And I think we should now reinvent our interests. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. It's 2 p.m. already, and unfortunately our event has come to an end. But I would like to sincerely thank all our panelists and also all our attendees for joining us today. And we had a wonderful opportunity to hear from Professor Dame uh, Jean Francis, uh, James Gray and Lieutenant General Richard Nugy about how we can ensure that the Arctic remains secure, sustainable and prosperous. Thank you so much once again, and we will be bringing many more discussions on geostrategic issues and environmental security matters in the upcoming weeks and months. You can check our events program on our website, and you can also subscribe to our events on www.geostrategy.org.uk slash subscribe. Thank you very much once again, and see you next time.